All right. So good afternoon and welcome to all who are in attendance. Uh, my name is Keelan McGriff. I am the vice chair uh, for uh, BOLD here. And um, I'm here to kind of give some introductions and kind of tell you a little bit about what's going on today. Uh, so before we start that, I wanted to give, take a moment to give a little bit of a background on uh, BOLD, which is our BRG here at Highmark Health. Uh, BOLD, which stands for the Black Organization for Leadership and Development, serves to support the strategic initiatives to empower Black employees in achieving great business results for the workplace, the marketplace, community, and patient experience. Uh, we do quite a bit of initiatives throughout uh, Highmark's footprint. Uh, I'm very excited to be part of this and the leadership team. Uh, we got a, a great presentation for you guys today. Um, who's going to help us kind of go into this uh, and and lead us into this presentation is going to be uh, Bob James, who is our VP of Diversity, Equity, Inclusion of Corporate Strategy, uh, Strategy excuse me, for Highmark Health and Allegheny Health Network. So, Bob, you want to take it away? Absolutely. Thank you so much, Keelan. It's <laughs> wonderful to be with you all today. Welcome to Highmark Health. It's going to be a wonderful afternoon as we celebrate the life of Dr. Martin Luther King through the life of Robert J. Brown. I'm Bob James, as Keelan mentioned, and I'm the Vice President for Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion for Corporate Strategies for Highmark Health and Allegheny Health Network. I work under the lead of our fabulous leader, Dr. Margaret Larkins Pettigrew, and our team of DEI uh, employees. Today, we have the opportunity to have a conversation, a fireside chat, with Robert J. Brown, who in and, in and of himself is a history maker. Uh, when I think of Bob Brown, who I've known for 25 years, I think of somebody who really personifies the dream that Dr. Martin Luther King has. And as we have our conversation today, you'll have an opportunity to see why I say that. Those are powerful words and you'll have the opportunity to see why I say that. So we're excited to gather here today to celebrate the life of Dr. Martin Luther King. Uh, Robert J. Brown, uh, you may have seen his bio. He was a close friend of the late Dr. Martin Luther King. And you'll get to hear specific accounts uh, related to Dr. King, uh, as well as some of the uh, events that Dr. King and Dr. Brown, or Robert Brown were involved in. To give a short introduction, uh, Bob Brown is chairman of, and CEO of BNC Associates, which is the oldest uh, African-American-owned public relations firm in the United States. Uh, he has a roster of Fortune 500 clients, including the Coca-Cola Company, Sara Lee Corporation, General Motors, Office Depot, and Nissan Corporation. Bob Brown also has served on several on the boards of several publicly traded companies throughout his career, and numerous nonprofit organizations. Continues to be vice chair for the National Urban League uh, at this time. He's received numerous awards. In 1962. Brown joined the board of the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, known as SCLC, working closely with Dr. Martin Luther King to broker a tenuous peace between business and the civil rights leaders across the country. Brown then served as special assistant to President Nixon from 1969 to 1973, and he directed the administration's creation of the Office of Minority Business Enterprise to successfully develop and expand minority enterprises. During his time at the White House, Brown helped to get federal grants to black businesses and help these business owners get greater access to lucrative federal contracts. Without further ado, let me introduce our keynote presenter today, Robert J. Brown. It's a pleasure to have you, Bob. Well, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you very much for inviting me. Absolutely. And through today's conversation, we encourage attendees to engage by putting your questions in the chat for Bob and time permitting, we'll answer any of those questions at the end of our session. Now let's dive into the discussion. So Bob, you're a son of North Carolina. Tell us a little bit about your family 
uh, and growing up in South and North Carolina, um, some of the challenges that you and your family may have faced given those uh, times that you lived in? Well, I grew up in a time when uh, uh, Black people were very restricted. Uh, when uh, we uh, would go anywhere on the bus in High Point, uh, we had to ride on the back of the bus. There were no options. And uh, if you wanted to ride the bus, you rode on the back. And uh, there were many other uh, things. I mean, you couldn't go into a restaurant and have dinner. Uh, you couldn't go to a lunch counter and, uh, and get anything to eat and sit down and eat. Uh, many times they wouldn't even want to serve you. And uh, there were all kinds of restrictions. Uh, the toilets uh, were separated. If you want to drink a water, uh, there were signs saying white water and other signs saying black water or Negro water. Uh, everything was restricted. And uh, those were the circumstances that I grew up in. Yeah, thank you, Bob. Um, and you were involved a little bit in the civil rights movement, of course. Uh, tell us a little bit about your involvement with SCLC, the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, and, and uh, how that would address some of the issues that you just uh, mentioned in terms of uh, segregation. Well, um, those were really uh, unbelievable years. Uh, and working with uh, Dr. King and Dr. Abernathy and Reverend Y.T. Walker and a whole range of other really unbelievable human beings and leaders. Uh, they were out there challenging everything under, under great stress and strain because if you went and you sat down at a lunch counter, uh, nine times out of 10, you were going to be arrested. They were gonna put you in jail and they might beat you or whatever in the process. Uh, there were all kinds of restrictions. I mean, just in your daily life, uh, you could go in and in a, a store where they sold clothes and try on anything like uh, people do, like they were doing then, but black couldn't do it. Uh, uh, and any kind of restriction that you can aim in a society, those restrictions applied to black people. I mean, who couldn't do anything. Uh, uh, most times, in, rather than ride the buses, uh, I would walk downtown, which was a pretty good ways, a couple of miles or so, and uh, or further. And uh, I, many times I would walk with my grandmother who raised me. She was, uh, a woman who was a wonderful human being who loved everybody, who was a great uh, church person, and whose father was a slave in uh, Anson County, North Carolina. And her father and mother were slaves. And uh, I used to go with her to her home area down there, uh, to the old house that they lived in. They had uh, about 10, 11 children, had uh, 11, they had 10 girls and one boy. And uh, she used to take me down there to see her uh, nephews and nieces and all that and, and to see how they lived. And uh, they lived uh, under the circumstances, they lived pretty good because all of them had houses, they were old houses, many times kind of ragged houses but they all raised their foods and everything. They had outhouses. And uh, I know when I was first growing up here in High Point, uh, we had an outhouse until I was a big boy. Uh, and when I told a big boy, I was about maybe nine or 10 years old before we got an indoor toilet here in High Point. And we were supposed to be in the city, but uh, uh, most of the black areas did not have uh, toilets, indoor toilets. Uh, black people had to have the, 
the uh, outhouses. And uh, there were many other kinds of things. And then, uh, you know, I got involved with uh, Dr. King and SCLC and uh, uh, that was a whole nother phase of my life that, that sort of changed my life. I saw what was happening with Dr. King and those and I volunteered my services and he became one of my closest friends. He and Dr. Abernathy and Coretta and the rest of them. And I traveled around with them, raised a lot of money for the movement and uh, went to jail several times. And uh, it, was, it, was a, it was a different kind of world back then, a world that, uh, it was a changing world because the world that we lived in, I didn't want to live in it. I decided as a young boy, I didn't want to do that. I didn't want to live like that all the rest of my life. And so uh, Martin Luther King coming along, uh, Reverend Abernathy, and Roy Wilkins, and all the rest of the uh, men who were doing their thing in terms of helping the free black people, I wanted to be supported. And I, I would always find out how I could do that and use whatever strengths that I had in terms of fundraising, in terms of contacts and everything else to make it work. And so I joined and fell in there with them and went all the way. And so, yeah, so really what I think I hear you saying is that you, you wanted to change your life. You wanted to change the lives of others in the sense of, uh, uh, you want to be treated as a full citizen. And with the restrictions, uh, I know our, our DEI team often speaks of the redlining that occurred and how it still has an impact on the healthcare of individuals today. And so um, that was just one of the restrictions that occurred. Did, did you live in a predominantly black neighborhood, by the way? Oh yeah, that was the only place for us to live for black people uh, throughout. And usually, whether you lived in the North or South, uh, you lived in a Black area. It wasn't particularly in the South. I mean, it was very restricted. Uh, there was no Black properties that were in white areas. Uh, it was totally restricted. And if you violated the restrictions, what would occur? Well, usually, uh, uh, there weren't too many violations, but if you violate, if you got a chance to violate uh, the restrictions, then uh, you would be subject to all kinds of things, whether it came from the local government, uh, whether it came from uh, the people in the government, you know, police departments or other I mean, there were all kinds of ways that they could uh, bring pressure on you through your job, uh, all kinds of ways. And, and they would bring that pressure. And many times, if you uh, bought property in a white area, uh, uh, many times they would run you down and make sure that you didn't mean to do that if you did that accidentally and, uh, and force you uh, to give that property up sell it to somebody else at a very nothing price and uh, to a white person. I mean, so there were all kind of restrictions. Wow. And I know you wanted to change that. And, and so you had the opportunity uh, to hear Dr. Martin Luther King. Tell us a little bit of how you came to meet Dr. King. Well, um, I had uh, heard him on the radio uh, preaching and uh, a couple of times and uh, and then I knew uh, several preachers who knew him and who, who knew, really knew his father because uh, his father was a very powerful preacher and a lot of the preachers you know like they do now they know every every other preacher they know the preacher and uh, so I got to know Dr. King uh, by virtue of the Southern Christian Leadership Conference. Uh, I got involved with the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, raising money, serving on its board, and uh, got to know Dr. King and Coretta King and uh, 
and Reverend Joe Lowry and Shellsworth and, and everybody. I got to know all of them because I, I actively participated in their programs and their programs were about the freedom of black people, many times feeding black people, many times getting black people out of jail and all kinds of things. And uh, I liked that. And so I decided that I wanted to be a part of that. So I followed it and, 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 and loaned and gave my support in every instance all over the place, whether they were in Mississippi, Alabama, Georgia, North Carolina, New York, wherever they were, and uh, became a member of the board. And, and uh, Dr. King and I became close friends along with Reverend Abernathy many of the other folk who were very intimately involved with uh, SCLC. So it's safe to say you were in the inner circle of the civil rights leaders at that critical time. Uh, and you mentioned that you, you had to go to jail a few times um, uh, as yeah. a civil rights leader. Tell us a little bit about uh, that experience and, and how it impacted you. Well, um, one of the first times I went to jail was when we were trying to, I was, I decided along with my late wife that uh, we saw all these young people uh, marching uh, to get some service at a drive-in restaurant that would not serve black people. And we decided to, to, that we were gonna march with them. So we marched with them uh, in the downtown area to this place and they call the police. And the police came with a couple of paddy wagons and police cars and everything. And they ordered us to move on. And we decided we're not gonna move until they served us. And uh, they said, well, all of you are under arrest. And so they drove a big old black truck and, and uh, some other vehicles and put everybody, took all of us to jail, to the jailhouse and put us in the lockers and locked the doors. <laughs> and, uh, so that, that was my first experience with jail per se. But before then, I had been a policeman here in High Point. That was my first job, a right. policeman. And uh, so it was a little bit uh, funny, me getting locked up and thrown behind bars by many of those fellows that, who locked me and my wife up. I had worked with, they knew me. And uh, there wasn't any rough stuff, anything like that. Nobody was getting beaten in the head, and, but they put us all in, in buses and wagons and took us all to jail, booked all those. And I stayed in jail for maybe uh, a couple of hours until we could be, all of us could get out. And that was my first experience with jail per se. But up until that time, I had been a policeman and then I left the police department and worked in uh, New York, Pennsylvania and Canada and, and all over as a federal investigator. So I knew about jails because I put a lot of people in jail and that kind of thing. So, uh, but, so it wasn't a strange thing to me from that vantage point, but it was strange for me to be locked up in a jail. I had never been locked up in a jail before. And that was a different kind of experience. Wow. And so as you got to know Dr. Martin Luther King, I know, um, you heard him preach uh, Many. Uh, and, and tell us a little bit about that experience uh, when you first encountered him. Well, uh, I found him to be an uh, uh, easygoing person, uh, a likable person, but a determined person who, who put God into everything that he did. And, I like that. I, I, I really, I was overwhelmed with that because I grew up in a home where my grandmother raised me and, and my older brother. 
and she was a praying woman. We, we had prayer every morning before we went to school. I mean, my brother and I would be saying, uh, oh, mama, we're going to be late for school. We can't. She said, boys, you better, oh, you, both of you better get here, get on this floor, get down on your knees, because we're going to have prayer before you go to school. And that was something that was embedded into my psyche, into my mind and my soul. And uh, I was never going to be able to get rid of that. So uh, it, was a, it was a wonderful thing for me because it was uplifting. And I saw how it affected other people around me. So I was, I was overjoyed to be involved and be there and to be able to. Right. So you met, you met Dr. King probably, in, let's just say, when he was in his early 30s. Oh, absolutely. And uh, so you knew him a significant amount of time during the movement. What, uh, how did you find him as a leader? What was he like as a strategist? Uh, obviously, we know that he was one of the more extraordinary uh, orators we have ever seen. Uh, give us your perspective of Dr. King from that, that firsthand perspective, what you saw. Well, he was, he was a, a good person. He was innately good. I mean, it was good. Uh, I mean, you could just, the way he handled people, the way he treated everybody. I mean, it was just, uh, it was just angelic, you know, it was just, uh, he was just a, a good, good person. He always wanted to do something for you or to help you. Or, or he was trying to figure out how he could help other people. And, uh, but his overwhelming desire was to see freedom for black people. And uh, he would say in many of the meetings that we, the board meetings, I was on his board too for all those years and, and travel with him from time to time. And, and he would be saying in the board meetings that if, if he, if, if they take his life, if the segregationists and people who oppose our freedom marches and everything, if they take his life, then he would hope that his life would be an uplifting factor for black people and for white people and for America to get his soul right. And uh, he was he was just, he was into it, hook, line, and sinker and with all of his might, with all of his soul and everything else. Uh, he lived what he preached about. And that was what I liked about Mark. He was, he was totally dedicated. And uh, you couldn't help but respect him and love him and keep following him and lift him up. And that's what I did. I did uh, so many different things for him and for the SCLC and the organization, raising money and, and getting food for people who had no food and just all kinds of things that we needed to be doing because it was, it was essential to the lives and welfare of the people, to black people back then during that time. Absolutely. Let me ask you this. You, you mentioned that uh, he had a sense for the danger that he might encounter, and he recognized that it could be life-threatening. Is that, is that correct? And that he, he could lose his life over, over these issues uh, and, and because of his leadership? Is that correct? Oh, absolutely. He would, uh, he would talk about it. Uh, and I recall one instance where we were having a board meeting uh, in uh, Richmond, Virginia. And um, he started uh, talking about how he, know, he knew that he was not going to uh, be a part of the movement uh, for all time that, uh, he had been presented with different kinds of threats to his life and all of that. But he just uh, asked God to help him, to lift him up, to lead him, and to give him the strength to carry on. As long as he felt that he was doing his job and doing what God has sent him here to do. And I recall one time we were having a board meeting uh, in uh, Richmond, Virginia, Virginia Union University. And he started talking about this. And uh, his father uh, just was sitting there beside me and he just 
jumped up and started to uh, just talk about it. He said, Martin, please don't say any more about this. Don't, don't do that. And his father just started crying and, and just, just over, he was overcome. And Martin asked me to walk him out and get him straight, which I did, and uh, uh, talked to him a little while and got him calmed down. But his father, I saw his father do that on more than one occasion when Martin would be talking about uh, how that he knew that he wasn't going to live forever and that, uh, you know, things wouldn't, should go on and that God was in the middle of this and that he would take us on to the promised land and that many of us had to just keep going, don't stop. If, if he's not there, keep on going, but let God lead us because he's going to take us through all of this. He's going to see us on the other side. And uh, those were times uh, that were very difficult, emotionally and otherwise. Wow, yeah. Uh, you tell us how you learned the news of his, uh, of his uh, death. Um, I had been to Atlanta that day. I, in fact, I talked to Martin and uh, he said he was going to be returning from Memphis. And uh, uh, early that morning, I talked to him and, and I talked to him that night after he got back to his hotel. And uh, he wanted me to meet him in Atlanta because we had a lot of things that we were going over and things he wanted to do and he wanted to talk to me about it. So he wanted to spend some time. And so I told him that I would meet him in Atlanta the next day. So the next day I got on a plane and flew to Atlanta. And then I was there waiting on him at the office and he calls uh, Dora McDonald, who was his executive assistant and told her to tell me that he was not going to be able to come back. They, they told him that he want, they wanted him to speak again, that things had been so su overwhelmingly successful. They wanted him to speak again that evening and that he felt that he had to do that. So when and she told me after he called and um, so I got on, a, I went to the airport and got on the first plane back to North Carolina. So I had to fly to Charlotte. And um, when I got to Charlotte, uh, I got off the plane. And when I went in the airport, people were running all over the airport. I mean, just wild and blacks and whites. I mean, just like the world was coming to an end. And I saw a sky cap and I asked him, I said, what on earth is going on in this airport? Is there a problem? And he looked at me like I had lost my mind. He said, man, don't you know they just killed Dr. Martin Luther King Jr.? Oh my goodness. That was very devastating. That was one of the most devastating times in my life. And um, so I went to, uh, I, I saw a lot of these phones hanging on the wall, you know, these old phones. And I picked up the phone and um, I called my home and my late wife answered the phone. She said, Robert, she screamed and she heard my voice. Where are you? What, what, what are you doing? She said, you should come home. She said, I thought you were with Dr. King. I said, yeah, but he didn't come back. And I, I got the first plane out to come back home. And she said, where are you? I said, I'm in Charlotte. I'm, I'm going to rent a car and drive home. She said, please, because people are in here. People have been calling everywhere. People all in our yard. And they want to start fighting. Some want to go get their guns and start shooting. She said, you need to come home. I said, I'll be there as quickly as I can. So I went out and rented the first car I could find and started driving home. And it was driving down the road from Charlotte Airport to High Point. And I turned the radio on. 
and it was bedlam on every channel. They were talking about what was happening, how the riots were occurring and people were burning up this and that and the other. And I could not, I couldn't hold the tears back because I knew Martin had been killed, but this would be the very thing that he would not want. He said, spent his life uh, trying to uh, take people away from the balance and so forth. And uh, so I finally got home and um, there were people in my yard, people in my house, they were everywhere. The phone was ringing every two seconds. And so, uh, and many people who were there were saying that they're going to get their guns and they're going to go downtown High Point and see what they could do. And they're going to find these people, they're going to kill some people and all of this. I said, no, we can't do that. So I organized a, a crew of some of those people that I knew very well and told them to get their cars and let's go keep driving all over and see if we can't stop this because this couldn't be nothing but a bloodbath. And it would be, it would not be the thing that Dr. King wanted. It would be the very thing that he did not want. He lived his life in such a way that he didn't want that kind of violence being perpetrated all over, whether it was black or white. Right. And so we uh, we spent the next few hours dealing with that, kind of got it curtailed to some extent. And then uh, I went back home and uh, uh, about four o'clock in the morning, the phone rings again, the phone keeps ringing. I decided to answer. It was Dora McDonald, Dr. King's secretary. And she was saying to me, she said, Bob, uh, uh, Coretta asked me to try to reach you and tell you that you need to come on back to Atlanta to go with her to pick up Dr. King's body. And that was, uh, that was a very difficult time for me in my life. I'm going to pick up Martin's body. I mean, that was, I can't tell you how much that hurt me. And, uh, it was difficult. Were you and, able to? Were you able to do it, Bob? Were you able to? Oh to, yeah! Oh no! Mm -hmm. I did it! I did it! I got up, got myself together, flew, got on the next on the first plane to Atlanta the next morning, and uh, I called, and uh, uh, Coretta had said that I think it was Mr. Rockefeller who had to go to Rockefeller, who had sent his plane uh, to Atlanta for Coretta and whoever she was taking with her uh, to go to Memphis to pick up Martin, Martin body. And so um, I went to an area where we were all gonna be waiting for her to get there. And um, I saw uh, uh, Harry Belafonte was there and uh, uh, Oscar Davis was on the plane and, and, and a number of staff and others. And we all got on the plane, Coretta came, and we all got on the plane and went to Memphis to pick up his body. And, you know, that was a whole nother thing. I mean, it was, uh, it still hurts. Yeah. And you marched, did you march uh, that next day or in the coming days with Coretta? Um, oh yeah, mm -hmm. oh yeah. Coretta was, she was, she was an angel and she was, she had a lot of courage. Um, many times she was very soft-spoken, but she was a very, very strong woman. And she had great leadership ability and skills. And most of us decided that we're gonna stick right with her. We're gonna lift her up, we're gonna support her. We're gonna raise money and do whatever is necessary to carry this movement on because that's what Martin would want. And that's what we did. And I know you've often stated that uh, Dr. King had a trait. Um, that uh, that made him that distinguished him, uh, and that was humility. 
Tell us a little bit about Dr. King's humility. Oh, he had a lot of humility for a man who had gotten the, some of the greatest awards and accolades in the world. Um, he would uh, just be trying to help people and uh, you know do different things for friends whether it be financially, if he could afford it, he didn't have a lot of money, but he would part with money and time and advice and everything else to, to reach out and help people, help many poor people, he would do that. I mean, he was, he had that in his, that was inculcated into his soul. That was a part of him as a human being and uh, he never let it go. He was always about that. I mean, we'd be out somewhere going to a meeting or, or some business situation or something else. And uh, people, you know, would be come up asking him for help or money or this, that, and other. And he'd be reaching in his pocket. If he didn't have any, you know, with some of us who have been with him, and he'd say, hey, look, I need this. And, you know, we would always be there. Uh, to back him up, but he was a special, special kind of human being, and uh, he was a great man, but what made him so great is that not only did he believe in God, but he took God's teachings and his belief and everything else and wrapped it up and worked at it, worked at it over and over again, all over to raise people up, no matter who you were or where you were, the lowest people, the poorest people, the raggedest people, everybody. And he could elevate himself to not just dealing with the poor, but he could deal with presidents, with kings, with corporate leaders and everybody else. He, he was sent here by God. I will always believe that. And, he changed America and he changed the world because people all over America and all over the world have traveled to every corner of the earth, all over Africa, all over Europe, and everywhere else, in Russia, China, and everywhere in Africa. Everybody still talks about Dr. King, Martin Luther King Jr. He is etched in history. God has, has put him up there and it will never change nobody can change it no matter how much you try and in one of his uh one of his sermons he mentioned you and for those who are in our listening audience if you google robert j brown and martin luther king uh you'll hear some audio you'll see a number of pictures of bob with the uh, dr king but you also hear audio and in one of his sermons he mentions that uh, you were his secret weapon what did Dr. King mean by that when he said, Bob Brown is my, my secret weapon? Well, I, I think, uh, you know, he used, to, he used to talk about that a lot, you know, to different people and sometimes in my presence and many times not in my presence and, uh, publicly and privately. Uh, he, would, he would constantly be asking me for advice. He would come here to High Point where I've always lived and um, and spend time talking and want advice on different things and wanted to know from me how he could uh, make the contacts and make something fruitful happen with a major company or association or something like that. And I would give him uh, my best advice uh, because he knew that I had been working and. and all of these years I've been working with some of the largest corporate people and governments in the world. And uh, I was willing to share whatever I had learned and however I learned God had taught me how to do things. And uh, I've, I've been fairly effective in many instances all around the world with all kinds of things. And, and he wanted to know, he would ask me directly, Bob, I got this problem here, I got to deal with this and this, that, and the other. What would you do? And uh, I would share with him uh, many things that I've learned. I said, some of the stuff I've learned, I don't think you want to do. <laughs> but, uh, 
I would share with him uh, much of what I had learned how to make things happen. And, and I would share with him my advice and counsel how he should do it. And uh, we had those conversations on many, many occasions. And I always say, you know, as we recognize some of the things that you were involved in and your vantage point in the civil rights movement, that you were kind of uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion before there was formal diversity, equity, and inclusion. And uh, tell us a little bit about how you worked with, with, Walt, with um, some of your customers or your clients, uh, like Woolworths, and, uh, and how you were able to serve as that liaison uh, to really help them understand what was going on in terms of the, uh, the, the, what the civil rights leaders were thinking about and, uh, and how you bridged that gap between what they were thinking about and what the corporate uh, individuals were thinking about. Yes, um, uh, see, uh, for all too long up until that time, now it's, it's more diversified, but back during that time, many of the corporations, uh, they weren't used to Blacks marching. They weren't used to Blacks coming with uh, uh, some papers to their office and outlining jobs that they wanted, outlining what they want the corporation to do, uh, to help the black community and all that, because much of that had never happened on a wide scale like it was happening. As Dr. King had pressed ahead with it, and they needed counsel and guidance and so forth. So many of the companies, uh, some of the largest companies in the world that I had been dealing with and have dealt with over the last uh, uh, almost 50 years or more now, uh, uh, they needed advice on what to do because their, their footprint was everywhere in all of the cities, all the communities, all over the world. It wasn't just in New York or Chicago or Atlanta. It was in all, all over Europe, all over Africa and everywhere else. And so they needed to know how to deal with different things and uh, uh, I, would, I would tell them, here's what you do. You got to get the job business straight. You got to get the business straight with uh, Black entrepreneurs just growing out there. You got to get the, the, the education piece straight now, that there are many Black colleges and universities that don't get any help from corporate America. They need more help. They need the kind of help that you can give them. And there are, there are just numerous things. There still are numerous things that, that, that could bring help bring America together. And that's what we need. We need more of that, more and more every year. That's what's gonna save our country and save our world. And so I would have those kind of discussions with Martin all the time of what I was doing and what I had advanced to different companies to do. And, and you know, just in terms of beating people, I know when, 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 before he died, he had started a poor people's campaign in, uh, in the Washington, as you recall. And uh, uh, he wanted to know from me what he should be doing. And then all of a sudden he's, He's killed, but uh, I, uh, I, Ralph was there and a number, Andy Young and the rest of us. Uh, and I just got some of my clients like uh, Nabisco and, and uh, others, Woolworth and others uh, around the country, around the world uh, to send truckloads of food and and things like that to all those thousands of people who were lying there in those tents and all of that, uh, food and water, bottles of water and truckloads of food and everything else. Uh, I, Cause I knew that that's what Martin wanted. That's what he was, that's what he was trying to do. And uh, it was, and I felt it was my job to follow through on that, not to, lay around and say, well, Martin's gone now, so we're not going to deal with that anymore. And Andy Young and all of them just 
jumped in the middle of this and kept it going. And uh, I worked with them and everybody else who was up there uh, to make sure that those people got a fair break. And I'm gonna open up questions in a moment. I wanna ask the question because you were on the front lines of, of uh, ensuring that there are voting rights for all in this country. And you had an opportunity to see um, the first black president. Uh, what did that mean for you having, having seen all that you had seen during your life from the restrictions to you know being jailed for uh, trying to ensure that you were a full citizen, you know, what did that, what was that moment like for you? That was an overwhelming time for me that, uh, uh, it was, I, I just wished during that time that Martin had lived to see what was going on and that we had a black president. Not only did we have a black president, but we had a black man who was a brilliant, upstanding, with a great wife and family, and who represented America as America uh, that all of us, the America all of us wanted to see. He was fair to blacks, whites, Hispanics, everybody. He didn't pick out uh, a few white people, a few black people to be responsible for. He made sure across the board uh, that he, that everybody got a fair shake at the starting gate. And that's all any of us have ever wanted. We want a fair shake for our children, a fair education, fair jobs and fair contracts if you're in business, just to play it fair. That's what America is supposed to be about. That's what we live and die for. That's what we fought all these wars for and everything else to bring America to the point where everybody could live and die free, where we could have uh, opportunities that were available to everybody across the board. That's what we lived and died for. That's what we're still living and dying for. And that's what we want going forward. And uh, you know, most people now uh, uh, understand that we still have some people who forgot about that, but most people still understand that and that uh, we're not going anywhere. We're gonna press forward and go with that, go with Martin's dream and all of the rest of the fighters who fought and died for this. And uh, that that's what it's all about, that everybody gets the equal share at the game. Thank you. And we have a question in the chat that kind of relates to what you just said. Uh, it says, from Angela Reed Davis, what are your thoughts about where we are as Black people today based on the struggle and the dream that Dr. King, you, and others fought for? Well, I think that we made a lot of progress. Uh, but I think that we got to uh, fight a little harder just so that the young people who are coming behind us can understand the dynamics of what needs to be done and will dedicate their energies and their lives to making this a better country for everybody, blacks, whites, everybody. And in order to do that, you gotta work at it. You can't be hanging on the block smoking weed and, and uh, uh, smoking dope and everything and uh, just hanging out, talking junk. You know, that's not, weird. that's not what it's all about. It's all about making sure that everybody has an equal job opportunity, that everybody has an equal chance to start and gain in terms of education, that everybody can, can move forward together, that our children have a chance to go forward and to do whatever they want to with their lives, black, white, blue, green, whatever. And that's what Martin lived and died for. And that's what we, we have to project that and we have to move that, that whole thing ahead. We can't just sit around and, and scratch our head and wonder, I wonder, I've heard some people say, well, you know, a lot of these young people are so bad now you can't do nothing with them. Well, you can't do something with them. They always been, some of them have been bad. You know, they were bad when I was growing up all those years ago. Many of them were bad. 
but we worked our way through it and we still have to work our way through it because you know everybody's not going to be right all the time and then those people in the street not going to be right all the time you have to work at it we have to get our community straight our organization straight we have to we have to work with each other and keep be vigilant all the time see we can't go to sleep Many people going to sleep. They say, well, my Luther King, you know, he did this and that and the other, and everything's all right now. We can go in a place and eat in a restaurant and everything. But there's so many things that we need to be uh, together on. We need to be fighting for and going forward with, you know. Absolutely. That's what we need to do. And, and you have a, a question that relates to that a little bit from uh, our... Um... Senior Vice President for Communications, Fred Ramos, asked, Mr. Brown, what do you see as the key two to three things we need to do today to help bring our country more closely together to overcome our social, political, and economic divide and to come together as one America uh, versus many Americas? And you're a bridge builder, so I, I know uh, you're the perfect person to ask that question to. Well, we have to uh, we have to go back to to get us to uh, what got us where we are now see we're a long way from the times that martin luther king started sclc and did all of what he did we're a long way from that but in many instances we haven't gone as far as martin wanted us to go mm -hmm. uh we haven't just buckled down and gotten in the middle of a lot of things our corporate community needs to be more and more involved with different things that are going on. Many corporations have done a great job, but they haven't gone far enough. They haven't gone deep enough, and they have to do that. This is America. This is our America. This is not uh, Russia's America or Chinese America. This is America. It's an amalgamation of everything and all kinds of people. And we are the greatest country on the face of earth. And we have to act like it. We have to act like we are God's children and we're gonna help people who are hungry and who are poor and who want to do something with their lives. We have to lift them up. We have to keep doing this. That's what Martin Luther King Jr. was all about, to eliminate the discrimination and segregation and all that, that's all fine. But there are many other aspects to all of our lives, white and black, Jew and Gentile, all of us, where we have to bring it together and we have to work on that. It's not gonna come by all of us sitting around acting nice and treating each other nice. We have to get out in the vineyards. We have to have these organizations who are formed to do these kinds of things and work with them and help them. And the corporations have a strong role in all this to make sure that what they're doing is the right thing to do and to work with different groups of people and different experts out here who have been involved in these communities. You know, sometimes we, many of us have gone to sleep and I'm not just talking about the corporations and, the, and, and just uh, uh, white people, black people, many black people going to sleep, black organizations are going to sleep. You know, they don't, you know, you don't see the kinds of involvement. Our churches, when Martin Luther King Jr. was alive, our churches were more alive then than I have ever seen them in my lifetime. And I've been around a long time. They, the companies, more involved, everybody, more involved, our, our, our other organizations, political organizations. We need to we need to gather in and, and wrap our arms around each other and, and be everybody ought to be fighting for that front line position where we're we're gonna be the best at doing what we need to do, not just for ourselves, our country, our uh, country, but what God wants us to do with our lives and with what He has given us. Because as my grandmother used to tell me. She said, Bobby, this is not your home. She said, you've got to give an account someday, boy. She said, so I want you to be the best boy, the best man, and the best person who would ever walk these streets. She said, in order to do that, you gotta be helping people. You gotta be doing things to help your community, 
to help your country and to help people all over. She said, that's what God's people do. And that's, we are all God's people. We forget that some of us think that we are God because we have made some money. And we have a little power in the organization. We have some authority. All of us have gone to another, another realm at some point. Bob, I want to... I want to take this moment. I know we're growing close to our end, but uh, I want to take this moment to thank you for sharing with us today your memories of Dr. King, uh, some of the accounts of your life of, of American history, and uh, giving us a sense for some things that we could do better. Uh, I appreciate it. And I think our Highmark Health and the others on our call who uh, joined us today. Uh, thank you for everything that you shared with us. You're an American hero. Uh, you're a history maker, and uh, and you're a wonderful friend. Thank you for the invitation, and God bless everybody. And I'll turn it over to Keelan. All right, that was really, really such a, a moving, you know, powerful, invigorating type of. Uh, presentation chat. I mean, you know, it, I know I talked to you last night, but this was, it still gives me chills just listening to these stories, you know, and, and allowing myself to, to live through history and live history through your, your lived experiences. So I, for one, I want to thank you so much because, you know, for an individual like myself going through and doing what I'm doing, you know, it's only just it energizes me that much more, you know. Um, so, Thank you all for absolutely attending this this great presentation today. Uh, you know, I, I know that there were so many questions. Everybody's looking for like a part two, but um, you know, thanks for attending. This was a great presentation. Um, I would be looking out for a lot more things that are going to come down Bold's pipeline uh, when it comes to Black History Month. Uh, when we're looking at education on you know, uh, Black Greek life, and it's important in history, uh, and why um, it's important for uh, Black individuals, looking at highlighting some of our um, our leadership uh, and, and the roles that we have here throughout Highmark's uh, footprint, and a couple other events that are going to, that are going to be great. So please be on the lookout for the flyers and things like that and and come and join us for Black History Month as we celebrate Black excellence and again also celebrating another new hero for ourselves, Bob. So thank you all for attending. Thank you, thank you very much.